Okay, log in uh, to Canvas so you can do your homework today. Uh, yeah, for that one, um, you can either turn in what we did last class or you can do what we do today. Either way, um, any you just need to put something in there. Again, we're going to be customizing PowerPoint again today, just like we did last class. Remember, we made a background and so But today, we're, mostly we're going to be doing the charts, right? You need to add a chart and a table to your final presentation. Again, today we'll be concentrating in PowerPoint on charts and tables. But before we do that, let's just look at some of the basic things that we need to discuss today. Uh, we have uh, two homework assignments that you need to do. One of them, of course, you've already uh, uh, done. These are the ones from last week, but notice the date. The date has been changed. We pushed it off till next, till this week. Because remember, this is last week, right? November 12th was last week. But we were only here for one day, and uh, Thursday we were off, so we didn't get to do hackings all over the world. We will talk about that today. Uh, and then if you didn't turn in what we did on Tuesday last week, you can turn in what we did today here. Okay? Okay. Uh, we did watch the funny video. We didn't talk about copyright, and we didn't talk about software development process, which we're going to talk about right now. We'll talk about that, then we'll dive right into our PowerPoint. And then this stuff over here kind of will push off till next week as well. We're going to have to kind of, as you can see, I changed the dates a little bit there, you know what I mean? So, uh, you know, everything got kind of shifted around because of day off, and I don't know. Things, we'll, we'll get to everything that you need for the final and stuff. And uh, so on. So, so don't 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 stress about it. Um, first thing we want to talk about uh, first is uh, let's talk about copyright. Okay, so we'll just talk briefly. We'll look at some of the things, and then we'll move on. So, the most important thing and the reason why I talk about copyright in this point of our class is because when you make a presentation, you're usually presenting to an audience, and when you present to an audience, you're usually presenting to uh, a group of people. And in that group of people, you're doing a presentation, and that presentation is a group presentation to pretty much anybody in the public, right? And so uh, you need to follow what we call copyright law, because the images that you use are being viewed by people, right? I can download and steal anything I want in my house, right? You can download anything you want, okay, whatever you want in your own house. But once you go out and start taking somebody else's images and presenting them to other people in a group area, then you're doing a presentation. Okay, so that's sort of what copyright is. Copyright is the law that was written in the Constitution. Why did they write copyright in the Constitution? Well, they wrote the copyright laws in the Constitution because the, the America, colonial America, was thieves. The way it was treated back then, they would basically take books that were in England, right? Put them on a boat, bring them over here to Estados Unidos or to America, and you would reproduce all the books without paying the people back in England. America was notorious for that. <laughs> and so they thought, hey, you know, we're bad people doing that. Let's write a copyright into our constitution so people don't steal from us. Right? And so that's sort of where the copyright law came from. Um, and I have some good precedents and things like that we can talk about. We'll put it into the class today. And then, um, you know, is there some things on the final about copyright law? One of those things on the final is uh, how much does it cost to copyright or at least submit to the copyright office a single, uh, um, single um, thing? Copy. No, 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 copy. It's a good question. Copyright law is for a fixed creative work. Patent is for a process or a procedure, right? Where a copyright is more for a fixed music. And of course, if I sing a song, that can't be copyrighted. What do I have to do for the uh, song to be copyrightable? It must be fixed. It must be tangible. You must be able to hold it or record it. It has to be either on a CD or on a disc somewhere or on a tape back in the old days. We had tapes back then. Or it needs to be written notes. But it has to be fixed. Singing a song is not copyrightable. It actually has to be fixed. That's one of the requirements. I think that's on the final too. In order for something to be copyrightable, it must be fixed. What does fixed mean? It means it's actually on something. You have to mail it to the copyright office. It has to be something that is on. Fixed means it's on something. An architecture plan is written down, right? Software can be copyrighted, but that's the programming. 
Yeah. How much does one single piece cost to get copyrighted? Thirty-five dollars. It's on the final. It's a demo. Thirty-five dollars. Where's your final exam notes? You need to have your final exam notes. Maybe you can share them. Okay. Let's give you answers to the final. So again, a single single thing is, is thirty-five bucks. Okay, let's look at the link here. So here's the copyright.gov. Okay, you can register a copyright. Now, do I can I claim copyright even though I don't register it? Well, sure. As soon as you make something, it is yours. It is copyrighted, right? It's just if you go to court, right, and you need to sue somebody, if it if the government has a record that you made it, it's a lot easier to sue somebody than that, right? And people violate my copyright all the time. And on Amazon, Amazon's notorious. Here, let me show you. I, I'm mad. So I have to show you this. Let's go to Amazon. Notorious Amazon. I hate Amazon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This one. Mm, look, this photo. My photo. Right there. I took that photo, right? That's my photo. This is the owner's son of the Zircon Corporation, but this is not Zircon website. They photoshopped my product out of the hand and put their product in there. I took this photo. Well, everything I take for them is very own copyright. That's another thing you should know. If you're an employee or a contractor, and in the, I'm a contractor, I'm not an employee, I'm a contractor, but in my contract, it says everything I take is. But still, you know, somebody stole my picture, they downloaded it off my website, and photoshopped out my product and put their own product in there. I keep telling the lawyer when it's going to send a cease and desist order. Yeah, it's not worth trying to, you know. Paperwork and all the headache to do it. But what I'm trying to say is that's a violation of the copyright law right there. If you take somebody else's picture, download it off the internet, and Photoshop your product in where my product should be, or even anything like that, right? So, how do you know when somebody has violated the copyright? And, um, you know, that's kind of a sticky situation. So, let's say somebody did take your photo, right? Or somebody did take your song, um, and you want to them and it goes to court, how do they determine what it is? Maybe they changed it a little bit, right? Remember the Led Zeppelin and the Spirit song, right? Right, the Led Zeppelin is sued by Spirit for Stairway to Heaven or something like that, right? They said, well, it's close enough, right? Well, when it goes to court, it's called the layman's attorney. If 12 people on the jury think, hey, that was taken from that, then you violate the copyright. Even if it's a different medium, let me give you a support. Uh, there was a court case of a photographer who took some pictures of a woman and a man holding a bunch of puppies. And he had it as a postcard in LA. And a famous artist, Jeff Koons, made a sculpture of a woman and a man holding a bunch of puppies. And the photographer sued Jeff Koons and said, You made that sculpture from my photo. And they went to court, and Jeff Koons won. And Jeff Koons is big. I mean, he was pretty much the highest priced artist in the world today. Until last week, when he did the hockey game in 1940, you know, the Lions played in the Before then, Jeff Koons was the highest price, you know, highest paid artist in the world. He lived in Japan. And he lost, and they were able to determine as a jury that, yes, they looked at the puppies and the photo, and then they looked at the sculpture. Totally different medium, right? One was a photo, one was a sculpture. But Jeff Coons had to pay the photographer all the money he made from the sculpture. And he could sell these sculptures for like you know, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars. He sold seven of them too, so the photographer made out, hopefully. So that's a famous one from nineteen ninety seven. Where is the price where it is? Copyright law right there. Uh, United States Code enacted, blah blah blah. 
I mean, it's been really hard to determine copyright nowadays because of the internet, right? People were downloading everything. Remember Napster? Everybody was downloading their MP3s like crazy back in the 90s. Woo! That was the fun days, wasn't it? Yeah, well, you know, they've tried to, you know, amend some of the laws to, to come up with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act of 1998 and so on. But still, you know, it's, 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 it's a difficult um, thing to, to challenge, right? Because people are stealing things like you saw my photo right there being stolen. And so um, there's a lot to it. My whole point of it in this class is when you do a presentation, you need to make sure any music that you use, any logo that you steal, any photos that you use need to fall within the rights that you use them. So my recommendation is to try and find images and music that you can use. Okay, so where can I find images that I could use? Well, I like Flickr. So if you go, let's say I'm making a presentation on, uh, we did what, um, oceans before, right? And things like that. So if I go to Flickr, Come, we're going to do a presentation today. So again, here's Flickr. You can search up here. Remember, we were doing oceans, right? So let's go to ocean, mm -hmm. and we see some pictures. Okay, the first thing you're going to notice in the upper left corner, it says any license. Do you see that? So when we talk about an artist, musician, or somebody doing creative works, and the law to to keep those creative works yours is called a copyright law. How you can distribute your work is by distributing a license to have people use it. Just like your software license, right? When you download a piece of software and use it on your computer, you're not buying that piece of software. That's not your software. You're, you're, you're downloading and using a license agreement to use that software, right? So the term that we use is called license. Same with a photograph, just like software. I can make my photos available for people to use. I can sell them to people. You know, think about it. I mean, that's where, you know, you go to, where, where is the stock? Uh, I stock, S-T-O-C-K, stock, photos.com, I think it is. is it? I stock photo. I stock photo. Uh-oh. Hopefully that's not porn there. There we go. I stock photo. Right, I stock photo. Right, you're you're not buying the rights. You're not buying that photo. You're buying the rights to use that photo. You're not actually buying the photo. It's not yours to keep forever. You're buying the rights to use it. What is that called? Of course, it's called a licensing agreement right here. So if I go to Flickr, let's say I'm making a presentation for my CEO. Right, maybe I'm just a little grunt in the in a in a in a, in a, in a company. Right, and the CEO comes to me and says, Jeff, make that presentation for me. I'm going to do a presentation. To the board of directors right? again you need to follow copyright even with the board of directors I know a lot of people don't do that but if it's a public presentation I can't make a presentation in this room and go over to campus center and do a presentation over there I'll be violating copyright over there because campus center is an open public area as well right anybody can go in there now in this room I can steal anything I want right in the copyright law, they have the educational code, or fair use is what it's called. In the fair use part of the copyright, I, as an educator, can download, steal, and show you anything I want in the classroom. Which then, what about an online class? Ah, that's a little sticky situation. So how we get away from violating copyright, because I download, I, I link to things, I steal things in my for my online class, as long as it is a registered person in the class and they have a login and password to get to the information I can steal on my online class. Right? They have to be registered and they have to have a login and password. So just so the online class is not open to the public is what it comes down to. Then I can steal, use any sound. I can play any song I want in this room without violating copyright. But if I go over to Campus Center, I should be giving royalties to the musicians, right? You should be paying the musician. If you're a DJ, you should be paying royalties. You can't just go and be a DJ and start playing your music anywhere you want. You're stealing people's music, even the DJ. Let's put it this way. My son was in the high school band, right? Marching band. 
right? The high school and the marching band needs to buy the rights to perform that music out on that football field. That's part of the price that they pay, and they do that. The teachers know that. The marching band teacher knows that. They pay for that music, right? So just keep that in mind. Okay, let's say you're doing a photo and you're doing a you're doing a presentation on oceans where it says any license here. You can click there and then you got right here. You have all Creative Commons. We'll talk about that in a minute. What is Creative Commons? We'll talk about that in a minute. But we have commercial use allowed, which means I can download it and put it on what a billboard, put it in my ad. Commercial use means commercial. You can use that modification allowed, which means I can change it. I can Photoshop my beautiful face into it. Mm -hmm. Commercial use and modification allowed, which means I can use it in my ad and change it as well. So if I choose that one, boom, I'll still get some images and stuff. Now, if I'm going through here and I'm looking at my stuff and I say, okay, this is a great photo. I want to use it in my presentation. The first thing you need to do is actually read. Now, I know it says commercial use and modification allowed, but the person who made this photo sometimes says, please give me credit at the end of your presentation or whatever. If you click on it, you'll see down here, let me close this, you see some rights reserved right there, right? So they do allow you to download. Here's the download button right there on Flickr, right? Uh, but it does say some rights reserved. If you click on that, it'll come and sell you. You are free to, here we go, let's read it. Just copy and redistribute the material in any format. That's good. Remix, transform, and build upon the material for any purpose, even commercially. Okay, good. Yeah. There you go. So again, you need to kind of read it and make sure. But I can take this photo and do whatever I want with it. This one right here. Okay. Because the photographer is telling me I can. Now some of them, when you are using images and searching for images, you know, what, what, you know, because of the internet, copyright laws had to kind of change or evolve a little bit. And so one of the, what they wanted to do was to be able to make people be able to, artists, photographers, musicians, and stuff, be able to distribute their music and their photos to other people and let them use it, but you you keep the copyright, right? That's my photo, but you can use it in your presentation, right? I want to be able to let that happen. So they came up with some, what's called the Creative Commons, okay? And what is Creative Commons? Well, if you go to their website, creativecommons.org, again, is a way, and this has come up, you know, the Creative Commons was kind of a, um, you know, they're, they're an organization, they're a nonprofit kind of thing that came about with being able to do that, be able to, to take their license, right? They give you, they, they distribute a license with your work, and it tells how people can use it. Here, let's just look and watch the video. Oh, that's not the video I want. <laughs> There's a video that talks about what is Creative Commons. Where is that? Hold on. Again, Creative Commons is for all kinds of things. You share your work, remix, share your work. You can get a license. Choose your license options and get the license. Get started. It's free to you. You don't have to pay them anything. Here it is. Want to work together? This is the video I want to show. How do I make it full screen? There's no full screen. When you share your creative photos, you're enabling people anywhere to use it, learn from it, and be inspired by it. Take this feature to shape young minds with work and wisdom from around the globe. And the artist who builds beauty out of bits and pieces she finds online. And the writer whose stories use ideas and images captured by people who People know that when you share your creative wealth, you can accomplish great things. They and millions of other people all around the planet are working together to build a richer, better, more vibrant culture using creative commons. To understand creative commons, you need to know a little bit about how copyright works. So you know that when you create something, anything, from a photograph, to a song, to a drawing, to a film, to a story, 
property, you automatically own all rights reserved copyright to that creativity. It's true. Copyright protects your creativity against uses you don't intend to. But sometimes full copyright is too restrictive. What about when you want all those millions and millions of people out there to use your work without the hassle of coming to you for permission? What if you want your work to be freely shared, reused, and built upon by the rest of the world? Well, luckily, there's an answer. Creative Commons. We provide free copyright licenses you can use to tell people exactly which parts of your copyright you are happy to take to the public. It's easy. Let me take a minute and it's totally free. Totally free. Come to our website and answer a few quick questions like Will you allow commercial use of your work? And will you allow your work to be modified? Based on your answers, we'll give you a license that clearly communicates what people can and can't do with your creativity. You don't give up your copyright, you refine it so it works better for you. Welcome to a free world where collaboration rules. It didn't even exist just for you to do, but now there are millions and millions of songs, pictures, videos, and written work available to share, reuse, and remix, all for free. I bet you that was a copyright free song, wasn't it? Uh, <laughs> okay, but I, I, you know, I think it's rather important that you understand this, understand what Creative Commons is, and how you can be a good citizen online. I think ethical reasons are important. Being ethical when you're building things, making presentations, you shouldn't just go to Google and steal any image you think is there. Now, Google does have an option for Creative Commons. If you do go to Google and you say, I, you know, Google has great, you know, stuff. So if you go to Google and you go to images over here and you type in oceans like we did, uh, you do have options here for, uh, where is it, more, I know it's here, tools. Uh, usage rights right here. See it right there? So again, under tools, you do have usage rights right here, and then they have labeled for reuse and modification, labeled for research, labeled for non-commercial reuse with modification, labeled for non-commercial use. So I guess their reuse with modification would be, um, like it says, we can reuse it and modify it. And so, you know, a lot of this stuff you'll see is probably on, you know, you know Wikipedia and things like that, Flickr and so on so you know i don't think that you know google does a very good job of, of you know managing this where i think you know somewhere like Flickr and some of those other ones i think do a better job of that you know because you know because they're made to share you know google's a little bit different google just goes and takes all the images it can find and then puts it in a list for you right they're not like uh, Flickr or somebody like that that's just you know concentrates and managing images and stuff like that so um, I just find it a little bit easier to hmm? Bing they, they got things as well I don't really use Bing too much Bing is the best there we go do they have an image area there it is okay oceans I'm sure it's here somewhere Images. Um, oceans. Oceans. What do we got? Moderate. Oh, here's a filter option. Oh, here's license right here. There we go. All Creative Commons public domain. Free to share and use. Free to share and use commercially. There you go. Okay. Yeah, use these, but make sure you give credit. So for your final presentation, you need to give credit for the photographer. You should give a, you should have a work cited slide at the end of your presentations where you list where you get the images. Okay, that's the most important thing. Ten points off if you don't give me credit. I don't know. I'm just saying that now, but you should have in your final presentation a copyright. Now in the in the um, requirements for the final, it says you can either do a works cited at the end or it says you can put the name of the photographer next to the image. Like in a magazine or book. You ever notice that sometimes in a magazine or book, you see the name of the photographer next to the image. You can do that as well. 
in your final presentation. Either do that. Yes? I've already given some assignments, except for the presentation. Uh-huh. So you did a sample presentation? Yep. And then you did the, uh, uh, the other one was uh, hackings all over the world? I did the PowerPoint uh -huh. presentation. I did the RSS feed and the maker report discussion. Okay, good. So you're ahead of the game. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do those next week. Some of those we had to push it off because we missed class, but that's okay, Dan. It's good that you're ahead. Okay, so uh, you get the idea. I don't have to beat this to death as far as trying to copyright. I just want you to be good ethical people when you're stealing music or stealing pictures. Just make sure you steal from the right spot. How about that? That's my whole point. Okay, let's do sound real quick. Where where, where can I steal get music that's copyright free? Where? So on your phone. You're violating somebody's copyright, so unless you bought it from a, a, a place, because then they might give you the license agreement for that. Yeah. Okay. So how about SoundCloud? Is that kind of a place where you can download music? No. Where, where, where can I get copyright music then? Where can I go? On on Google. Copyright free music. Do I know it's copyright free though? Ben Sound, Premium Sound Beat. Yeah, I don't really know. Some some people said that on SoundCloud you can have some some people can post their songs, right? With Creative Commons licensing agreement. Okay, well. I don't know. I'm not too good with music. But remember, music costs a lot. And where can you buy music if it's copyrighted? ASCAP. A-S-C-A-P. ASCAP. Dot com. Right? You want to buy that famous song for your movie. Where can you buy it? ASCAP. Okay. So this is where musicians put their music and, and people can go and buy the license to use that. Okay. I think I did tell you my story of the um, um, Randy Treadwell, right? Randy Treadwell was here. He's a musician here, or he's the uh, president of music for Paramount. He did some Paramount films. He came and spoke on campus. I don't know if I told you that story. Let me tell you again. He's the president of Paramount, which is a big music studio, or film studio, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So any song that goes into the films have to go through him. I have his video online. I think it's like an hour long. It's an hour and a half, actually. I've been talking to him for a couple of years. He's a smart dude. He's a nice guy. But a great talk. You know, he talks a lot about um, you know what kind of musicians work in film. Like if you were the director, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, all his little things. His famous, my famous part of that one I learned when he was talking about the little film thing. The director comes in and says, you know. Oh, the final movie's gonna have the heroes driving into the sunset, and I was thinking in my head, you know, uh, at the end of Thelma and Louise, and they're flying over the cliff, right? And you want that jumping jack flash or something playing in the background there, and he's looking through his wall. You know, the Rolling Stones, and he has to tell the director this, the Rolling Stones song is the most expensive love song. It's probably gonna cost seven hundred thousand dollars to put in your movie, right? He even said that. He's like, oh, they're gonna love this Rolling Stones song to put in the movie. Seven hundred thousand dollars to put it in the movie. That's going to add a lot to the budget, you know, just for that one song. That's why you see a lot of musicians where they use just part of the song, right? So you can buy the copyright to just part of the song, you know, and things like that. Or you can have somebody redo the song and then pay a little bit less as well, right? You have somebody else come in and just play the song. It's not the original. So think about that, music and stuff like that. So be wary of that. Uh, can I just link to any video on YouTube when I'm doing my presentation? I mean, YouTube is all kind of, it's really a messy area for me these days, right? I mean, who can use music? I kind of get away with using music on some of my songs because I let YouTube know I'm a teacher and that I even have it. And I, I, I'm in an educational category on YouTube. But they still dig me sometimes when I put a song that's very popular or something like that. Uh, you know, they can't 
I have a great, great, great anim uh, video that I did in the and I put a song in the background just basically awesome. Awesome. It was a song I guess, but it worked well. So Okay, let's see what else is listed. We'll go through real quick. Um so uh, you can see copyright is here, Wikipedia, um, like I said, how much does it cost? Um, where was cost? Mm, I don't know. There's somewhere it's cost. It's $35. Remember that one for the final exam? Um, and then there's different types of rights, exclusive rights, and things like that. Fixing, remember I said it has to be fixed to be able to, you know, nuts. The Bernie Convention allows a member of the country to fix to enjoy copyright. Mm -hmm. Whatever. Here's the copyright notice. What was it? Command G on the keyboard, right? The symbol, this one right here. You've seen it before. Mm -hmm. And then, um, what else? Then we didn't really have a lot of time to talk about patents, but patents is a form of intellectual property. A patent gives the owner the right to exclude others from making, using, selling, and importing an invention for a time, limited time period, usually 20 years, right? The patent rights are granted in exchange for enabling public disclosure of the invention. People are employed to do research are often obligated by their employment contracts to assign inventions to their employee, and most researchers are often obligated by their um, countries. Patent rights fall under civil law, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, patents is more for inventions and things like that. Just like uh, 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 my stud finder company, Zircon, had exclusive rights to the capacitor and the way that it does the electronics for 20 years. That's so why for 20 years they made all the money. And then, and, you know, in the late 90s or, or early 90s, late 80s, the patent was expired and everybody started using the same technology and now we have lots of competition but before then we had the exclusive rights to build the electronic stud finder so we made a lot of money in the late 70s in the 80s um, because of the patent no it's it's very short period usually 20 years depends on the type of patent I think like like pharmaceutical patents aren't that long, I don't think, because the dr they want to get drugs in the people, you know, right? It's important. Yeah. 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 Well, some things you know also are maybe longer. It depends on the type. If you want to see, I think one of the best websites. I love this website. Is the um, Google one, um, the Google patent thing. Uh, have you ever seen that one? Um, here, let's go. Let's find it. I'll show you that one. Uh, it's the Google patent patent page patents patents.google.com. You can search any product you want and find the patent, right? There's a lot of really good ones out there. And just loves going through and searching. It's what a great research tool. So let's say you like chairs, chairs or shoes, shoes. Let's put in shoes. They got all kinds of patents. Look at this. We got air pumping inserts for shoes. Look at this. And it tells you the date. Look, 19, or 2004. Or no, 1996. Look at that. 1996. And, of course, it shows you the drawings. Right? Who, who applied for the patent? What year they applied? And a description of it. Look at that. Air Jordans back then in 1996. Remember the Air Jordans? Okay. And what else? Give me something else. What do you want to search for? Anybody have any idea what kind of patent? But how about water bottle? Is that bottle? Water bottle? Plastic blow mold water bottle. Look at that. Two thousand. Cap locking device for a water bottle. Water dispenser bottle. Will water filter bottle combination of water bottle golfer's water bottle. What does that mean? You got to put it in my golf. Oh, look, it's attached to your golf cart. Look at that. Somebody made a patent for attaching 
your freaking water bottle to your golf cart. Look at that. So a lot of fun. If you you know you're bored someday, just go to patents.google.com. You can, I, I could spend and literally the first day I found this, I think I spent two hours on here just typing stuff and looking at diagrams and things. It was cool. It was fun. I was like, wow, this is the coolest thing ever. Yeah, it's fun. Okay, so you get the idea where we at. We have patents. Uh, oh, we did talk about Creative Commons. We saw the video. Uh, the, if you want, if you own um, um, Lynda.com, uh, they have a whole class on copyright. If so if you have a Lynda.com account, there's one right there. Uh, what else do we have this week? Um, uh, software development process. I, you know, we used to talk more about that in here. Um, you know, it's kind of an old, boring kind of talk you know back in the old days and what i mean by old days is you know before we had such fast internet people would write software you know in a, in a team kind of thing they would then distribute it on a disc or on a cd or something like that right and then you know your licensing agreement would be there with the cd you would put it in you would install it on your computer but now you know, software is, 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 is more in the cloud more of days and, and things like that. And so this whole software development process has really evolved and changed. And I think probably the best um, part, the best to read is the, um, the uh, LinkedIn software revolution. And this is from 2013, so it's a little older reading. But in this article, you know, they talk a lot about how LinkedIn sort of changed the way that we do software development, right? In that it's not, you know, you have an idea, you hire some programmers, the programmers write some code, you troubleshoot, beta test the code, right? Um, and then people then go and, and buy that software from you, the software license to use it. And uh, they install it on their computer, and you go from there. You know, LinkedIn sort of evolved and changed that in that, you know, they they the software development is a never-ending way of improving software, right? Just like now with your phone, right? You get your apps on your phone, and there's always updates, right? Every week, every two weeks, it says, hey, you gotta update this. Microsoft update that, right? There's no, you know, kind of software development process anymore. I mean, the pro well, there is a process, but the process is an over-evolving software, right? It's not software that is ends, right? There's no end to it. You know, back in the old days, you'd write your C++, you'd make a code, put it on a disk, and you were done. Collect your money, boom, you go. It's, it's never ending now. And the problem is, is that, um, what is the problem with that? Well, um, it, it, the problem is you have to constantly update. That's one of them. Operating systems are changing. You have to update. You know, I have a lot of software that I bought for the old Mac OS. Right? I have a whole bunch of disks and a bunch of old software that was written for um, you know the old Mac before we went to Mac OS 10 or X or whatever you want to call it. You know, you know that was written in the old file format, the HFS format, right? And 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 I can't look at those unless I find an old operating system, right? So, you know, it's so this is a really good. If you have time to read this one, I thought this was probably a good article about their never-ending um, software development, and it's kind of pioneered by LinkedIn, I guess, is what they're trying to say here. Uh, it depends on how old it is, right? If you have an old phone, I sometimes it's best to avoid updating if you can, because it'll just slow it down, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a whole bunch. There's a video here. The problem with this is that it's kind of old, 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 old. Welcome back. In the previous video, we looked at the full application life cycle of developers' retirement. See, video, there is no retirement. That's what I'm trying to say. You know. There are two types of application development mm -hmm. tools. New application development and customization. New application development is when a brand new piece of software is made. And customization is when you use your existing software but modify it to meet a customer's needs. Examples of this include a new telecom billing system or a banking system. 
or in this case, like Linux, right? A lot of the, uh, um, that's what Red Hat sells. Or didn't Red Hat just get bought? I think we talked about that in class, right? You know, what, what did Red Hat do? Well, they took Linux. They Linux was an open source software, right? And they customize it for each customer. You could go to you could go to Red Hat and say, I need this software to do this, this, and this. They'll customize their version of Linux to meet your needs, right? They're not rewriting Linux, right? That's sort of what I'm talking about. So we don't have to sit and watch this video. I, you know, we get, I'd rather do PowerPoint today, anyways. But you get the idea. You can look through that. I think you know the most important thing is that software development is something that's constantly evolving and changing. So next week we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, uh, how to write software, what are the languages that are new, what are new languages coming out. Of course, we all want to do and, and take my class, right, which is the most modern piece of software programming, Swift, if you're an Apple person, I guess. Or, of course, you can do Java and Eclipse or um, Studio for uh, Android. So uh, we'll talk about that next week. We'll look at some Android and we'll look at the difference between iOS and Android and what is object oriented programming and we'll look at some difference. We'll talk about Java and what why Java is so important. What may, the revolution. I remember 1995 when Java first came out. Whoosh. I remember writing my first Java programming in 1995. I bought my first Java programming book from Stanford. I was at the Stanford bookstore. You ever go to the Stanford? What a great bookstore, Stanford bookstore. In 1995, I was at Stanford bookstore, and it was a Java programming book. And Java just came out. It was a brand new kind of thing, you know. I bought it, and I did the first couple chapters, and it was just, ah, amazing. And then I decided to do 3D and animation and concentrate on Android. But I should have stuck with Java. Yeah, I would have been somewhere instead of a loser like I am today, right? I'm just kidding. Okay, so uh, I don't know. They ha I have some links to Microsoft, how they do software development. What is their? Um, they got some videos you can watch. Okay. Uh, there's Android Studio, like I just said, and it's free. So Android Studio. So we can talk more about that next week. So they have a whole bunch of those. So let's leave that for next week. Uh, okay. We'll talk more about that. So that was there. Copyright hacking is all over the world. Let's get to that. Maybe we could do that right now. Let's do this uh, assignment right now. Let's get it over with. We'll do this for the next uh, 15 minutes, and then uh, we'll dive right into our PowerPoint. Uh, we'll do our PowerPoint real quick today, and then uh, we'll go to our meeting. I have a meeting. You guys get to go home. I have to go to a meeting. Okay, so uh, what is this? Hacking is all over the world. Well, um, you know, there's a bunch of, this is a video. You don't have to watch the whole thing, but this is a video about uh, uh, the guy got hacked. And he talks about how he got hacked. Oh, Daily Motion is kind of, um, I don't know if this link works anymore. Oh, I have to do my copyright thing here. We don't have to watch this whole thing. Let me just summarize it a little bit. So this guy talks a lot about how he got hacked and how easy it was. And so a lot of, you know, and so you can watch that if you have time, this one. Um, and then this, let's watch this one. It's kind of short. Hold on. You know, this small idea can actually make an impact across the globe. This is kind of long. We, we don't have to watch the whole thing. We'll watch part of it. This is my original identity. I use this when I'm online, when I'm on Twitter, and on LinkedIn, and when I act professionally. And I love social media, I have to say that. But I also have another name. And this name, yeah, I used that for seven years on Facebook. And all my friends know me. Um, and I use it on Pinterest as well. And that's because I'm not professional there. And I tend to be a little more private on Facebook. And I also created a third identity, Lena Back. Um, and that's because so many pages and apps ask me for personal info constantly. And if you go to fakenamegenerator.com, you can completely make a really good identity where you get everything from height and weight and eye color and even credit card number. So, so why am I so uh, kind of almost obsessed with this, you, you might think? It's because I, I did this book with a, with a friend of mine called Stefan Hoyer, who lives in San Francisco. And when he searched for this book, was it? A huge eye opener for me. 
what is actually happening out there on the web and on your phones. Um, we are completely a survey, 100% in everything we're doing. And to understand that, we have to understand everything about big data. You probably have heard about big data, it's a buzzword these days, right? And one of the best examples, some of you might have heard, was the supermarket target in the US. They wanted to uh, get to women before they got pregnant, actually even before they even knew themselves that they were pregnant. So they hired some data scientists and they took all the data they had themselves on their customers and enriched that with data from social media and databases and everything they could buy. And then they created a pregnancy prediction machine. And then they could start marketing their products to these women who didn't even know yet that they were pregnant. And they were so successful that one day a father came down to Target, really, really annoyed, saying, well, you're sending these uh, coupons uh, to my 18-year-old high school uh, daughter as if you want her to be pregnant. And yes, she was pregnant. And he came back two days after and apologized and said, I didn't know she was pregnant. And that's what big data can do. Uh, it can predict things we can't even imagine what is happening in the future. It can predict, predict suicides. <laughs> it can predict whether you're getting pregnant or you're, you are getting an alcoholic. And what can, what can that data be used for? It's only up to your own imagination. Another example of big data is Instagram. A lot of you are probably using Instagram. Why did Facebook pay a value higher than the New York Times? It's, an, it's like an ad making no money. Two years old, 13 people were there. It's because of data. There's so much data in Instagram. Of course, also because it's a mobile app. But there's so much data behind every picture. Every single picture you tell Facebook where you took it and who took it. And then you have to go social graph. You're sharing everything with your friends. That's a lot, worth a lot of money. So we're talking about a gold rush. And World Economic Forum calls personal data the oil of the day. That is what is making the whole digital world function. And as soon as something becomes so um, valuable, uh, everybody wants it, right? And we are seeing the black market for it as well. And a guy called Joel Ito, who is the director of MIT Media Lab in Boston, he compares the situation today to the situation in the 50s and 60s, 60s where people were polluting uh, the environment, if you think about it at that time. And today we're paying high price for that. He is saying what we're doing is we're polluting with personal data. And many of us are going to pay a personal price later. I don't know if it's true, but it might be, and that's why I'm worried. It's all about your personal data. It's not one single Facebook update or one search. It's a puzzle. Everything we're doing is collected in big data banks, identity banks, and then it's stored and replayed. For example, a data broker, Axiom in the US, they have like 500 million profiles on people. And every single person, they have 1,500 data points on those people. It's not something you join voluntarily. They just take it from the web and the databases. And they know, you know, what, what are you eating in the airplane? Um, what are your vacation dreams? What are your health worries? <laughs> Everything you're searching on the web, you're sharing yourself on Facebook and all the other places. The title indicates that I'm going to talk about sex. I'm not talking about sex in real life. I'm talking about data sex, which is actually a, 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 something wired for, uh, calls this what I'm going to tell you about now in the last issue. Okay, right, we don't have to sit through the whole thing. You pretty know much that you know you shouldn't share your data with like crazy online basically is what she's trying to say okay so uh in order to make yourself a fake identity we're all going to do it right now so this is what i want you to go to fake name generator.com let's do it so this assignment you go to fake f-a-k-e name n-a-m-e generator generator right there's fake number generator right there we'll do it together it's f-a-k-e N A M E G E N E R A T O R dot com. Go there right now. We're gonna make you a fake identity. Yeah, yeah. I want you all to make a fake identity, and we'll do one together. And then you turn it in for homework. And then we'll do our PowerPoint. 
You can turn that in as well. Fake name generator dot com. Did you guys find it? Did I type it right? Fake name generator dot com. Okay, did you get there? First option is gender. You can choose whatever you want. Random, male or female. Name set, you can have different languages. You don't have to be Estados Unidos. You can be any language you want. You can choose whatever country you want to be from. They got advanced options, which allows you to choose your age. If you don't want to be an 85-year-old person, go to advanced options, and you can choose what age you want to be. Maybe you want to be 24 to 44 years old, and, um, and so on. And then when you're done choosing all these options here, you hit generate, and what it'll do, it'll give you, um, oh, I thought I chose male. Why am I getting female? It'll be male. Generate. There you go. Generate if you don't like it. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, hold on. I'll go back. Okay, I'm here. I chose gender, male. Yeah, yeah. Then I went to, if you want to choose age, you go to advanced options right there, advanced options, and you can change the age you want, and then you can change the male or female here, and then if you hit generate, it'll generate a name down there. Let's read what it, what does it make for you? The, the important thing is what is it making for you, right? When you sign up for things or when people are asking for data, what is the common things they ask for, right? Of course, your name, right? You have an address. It gives you an address here. It gives you your mother's maiden name. It gives you a social security number if you want. Uh, you got to sign up if you want a real one, I guess. I don't know. They say you should click here to find if your social security number is online. That's an ad. There's some ad stuff there. Uh, and then they give you a phone number. They give you a country code. They give you a birthday. Tells you how old you are, what is your zodiac sign, right? This is great for when you're dating out there, right? Do you ever ask? That's a 70s thing, right? Remember that? Aquarius. Some of us remember the 70s. Yes. Uh, you get yourself an email address. You get a username and a password. You get a website. Look, you get your own testlabreports.com. You get your own website. Tells what kind of user agent you use. You get a Visa card, you get an expiration number, you got your CVV2 card, you get your Handy Andy company is who you work for. I'm a labor relations director. Tells you how big you are, how heavy you are, what type of blood type you got, what is your UPS tracking number, favorite color, and what kind of car you drive. I drive a pretty old car, it's probably pretty clunky. I guess because I'm a I'm a labor relations director. Okay, so find something. You can hit generate again if you don't like that one. So how do I turn this in? Um, you can you can save this as a PDF if you want, or you can take a screen grab. It's fine. It's hard to send it to me. Um, you know, some people I say you can save page as uh, um, a PDF. How do I do that? No. Um, or just take a screen grab. You don't have to give me everything. How about, oh, what's a screen grab? What do you do? You hit Command Shift Four, and you take a, a screen grab like this, and then just send it on Canvas to me. But look at it, see what it generates for you. Maybe do a couple different ones. Maybe find, you know, I got some good ones. I get some good assignments. Uh, if you want to save this, the whole page here is a PDF. You can use the print option right here. See the print option right here, and in print you can save as PDF right here. Save as PDF right there, and you can give it a name, Jeff's new name, uh, and you can download that. So if you wanted to save a PDF, I don't know where it goes. Desktop. Maybe your volume of your computer is turned down. So if you save as a PDF right here, 
it'll give you some info right there. See that? How did I save as a PDF? <coughs> you can save anything. <coughs> Ooh, that toxic waste is getting to me. You can save anything as a PDF in the print function. So again, if you want to save as a PDF, you go under File, Print. File, Print. And then in the print option, uh-oh. Hacking is all over the world. So again, if you go under File, Print, you go, see where it says PDF right there? You can save as PDF. That's another way. You either take a screen grab or save. Either one, but go and upload it to your Canvas. In Canvas right here, under Hacking is all over the world, you should be able to submit your, your assignment right there. So go and download. Give me a good identity. And then we'll dive right into PowerPoint after that. So I'll give you a minute. I'll help you upload. And then where it says choose. Okay, let's dive right into our PowerPoint today. Mostly we'll be talking about um, um, tables and charts. So in your final presentation for this class, you need to have a table and a chart in your PowerPoint presentation. Okay. So let's concentrate on that today. So um, I'm going to start with uh, PowerPoint here. Let me close some of this stuff here. So again, I'm going to open up PowerPoint. Let me close uh, the PDF. Remember, you can make a PDF out of anything if you go to File, Print, File, Print. So uh, I'm going to dive right into PowerPoint right away. So I'm going to go right in. Remember last class we actually had started with a um, um, a pre-made template, right? And we customized it. Um, I don't know. I'm going to start with a blank one. I don't really like the pre-made templates. Um, but if I can get blank, there we go, finally. But before I start to uh, make my presentation, I'm going to choose myself a um, color scheme and things like that. So when it builds the presentation or builds the table, it's going to go and make the colors that I want. Right, so I know I'm starting with a pre-made uh, thing here. So let's practice some of the things we want to do. We want to have a background image to our presentation. We need a footer. Some of us need a footer, so we'll review how to make the footer again, and then we'll choose a color scheme, and then we'll make a table, and we'll make a chart. We'll animate the table and animate the chart, and by that time, we'll be time to go. Okay, so let's go to it. Again, to customize our PowerPoint, we're going to go right into the Slide Master. If you don't remember how to get to the Slide Master, it's going underneath the uh, View right here, the View option right here. Under View, you'll notice it says Slide Master right here. In the Slide Master, I'm going to choose a bunch of different options so that it generates the things that I'm looking for. If I click on Slide Master, it takes me to the Slide Master. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go all the way but to the top one right here. Remember the themes up here. This is where we make our, our, our pieces up here. So again, when you go to Slide Master, click on this top one right here. In this top one, I'm going to make some background colors, and I'm going to add the footer and all that stuff right now. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do is uh, go to the background where it says background styles right here. And I'm going to choose a nice style. you got some solid color ones there. If you want a gradient background, you have to go to format background, which is right here. So again, it's right here. It says background styles. And down here where it says format background. You can choose a gradient. I kind of like gradients. I think this, this is kind of the gradient I made last time, isn't it? I kind of kept the one I made last time. You can change it if you want to be a different color if you want. Maybe I'm going to put a little, ooh, that's a little bright. I don't know if I like that one. How about dark? Whoosh. No, I don't like that. Uh, there we go. We can do light. That's fun. There we go. Nice and light. So whatever. Again, it was under background format, and there was an option for gradient fill. You can do solid gradient fill 
You can put a picture back there again, though. If you put a picture back there, woo, look how busy that is. That's not a very nice background. If you do use a picture for your background, make sure that you choose a nice picture. Uh, you can go under file right here. Maybe we're doing oceans, remember, or, or put a flower. Look at that. Nice flower back. Woo, look how busy that is, though. Ooh, that would be hard to put text on. So if you do use a picture, look at the transparency option right here. Woo. There we go. Oh, there we go. There's a nice background. Look at that. You can still see the flower, but you can still see the text, right? Okay, so these are your options. How did I get to these options? It was under background styles, format background, right there. Format background. This popped up right here. You have all these different options. If you do use a picture, make sure you give it a transparency so it doesn't overpower your text. Next thing I'm going to do is I can highlight my title up here and I can change the font under home. If you don't like this boring, whatever this one is, you might want to have a nice, nice font. Copper plate. Ooh, look at that one. All these fonts are pretty bad. I'm still in the master, yes. Mm -hmm. Under home. So I highlighted the text up here. I went to home. And then I went to font is right here, this option. And you can choose color here as well. You can highlight the text. Go to home. Font. Color. And then remember, we need to have a graphic on each one of our slides. So if you want to steal a graphic, you can go steal from the internet. Uh-oh, Jeff just said steal again. No, your final presentation, you should try and be copyright. So how can I get a copyrighted clip art file? Maybe I want to have like a little flower in my upper corner up here, right? And I want to uh, have that. Well, you can actually search for copyrighted clip art as well as a photo, right? I know we were doing photos before, but you can do clip art. So Google actually I think is better at that than, I know we were looking at Flickr, but Flickr is a photo kind of thing. If you want, you can actually go to Google, and here we go. So if I go to Google, I go to Google, and I type in images, and go flower, flower, F -L -O -W -E. Flowers, flower. Uh, you'll notice under tools you have um, copyright there, so you can change that to again label for non or no labeled for reuse and modification. And then there is a clip art option, isn't there somewhere in here? Settings, no more. Isn't there a clip art option in here? Oh, there it is. Thank you. You have face, photo, clip art, line, line drawing, animate, and then we go. Oh, we could, we should do animated GIF too. <gasps> we forgot to do that too. Uh, we got to put an animated GIF in our presentation as well. So again, labeled for reuse and modification, right? Just like we talked about already in our copyright discussion. Then I chose clip art here, and so the easiest way is to grab your clip art. Look for one that has a transparent background, maybe. Remember how to find the one with the transparent background has this checkerboard pattern. Do you see this checkerboard pattern there? That means, you know, so if you choose one that has a solid white background, that it, it, it'll be solid white inside of PowerPoint, right? But if you choose one that has this checkerboard pattern back here, it's going to be transparent. And this is going to look very nice in my presentation. How can I copy this to my presentation? I can just right click on it, say copy image. So I'm going to right click, say copy image, and I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint presentation and I'm going to paste, edit, paste. And it's going to paste it in there. And then, of course, I don't want it in the middle of my page. I'm going to click on it and move it up here to my upper corner. And that'll be on all my slides. Isn't that nice? So, again, Searching for an image online, I tried to follow copyright by saying license modification and reuse allowed, and I did clip art, right? And then I went and I copied it and pasted it right into PowerPoint right there. How did I copy and paste? Well, you right click, 
right? And there's a whole bunch of them here. That one's, oh, look, this doesn't have a checkerboard pattern now. Look at that. So that would, you know, so if it doesn't have the checkerboard pattern, watch what happens. If I copy this one and I put it in PowerPoint, edit, paste, look, ugly white edges, right? Do you see that? So when you're searching and looking for things online and you want it to work and, and this one, oh look, see checkerboard pattern right there, checkerboard pattern. That's the one if you want it to look nice in your PowerPoint. Now, of course, if you're using a white background, it doesn't really matter, does it? I guess it doesn't matter. So again, put something in your PowerPoint so it looks good. I just put it up there. So again, we got a background, we have this. Last thing we're gonna choose is a color scheme. And I can pause right now. Let me pause and you I got an image, I got my title, got my background. The last thing in here under slide master right here, see slide master. Here's my colors right here, or theme right here. I'm gonna go to colors. And so why do I want to choose the colors here in the slide master? So that when I make my chart and make my table, it's gonna use these colors to make those things. Okay, so the reason why you choose them here, and so think of your theme. What is my theme? Maybe it's flowers. Maybe I want to use a nice yellow, orange, or, or kind of theme that's nice and flowery. Is that a word, flowery? I guess that is. A, I'm going to choose yellow. See that right there? That didn't do anything really, but you will see it when we make the thing. Oh, the last thing, oh, we got to put the footer in there. If you don't remember how to put the footer in there too, before we leave the slide master as well, is underneath uh, insert we have slide number okay so before I leave the slide master I go to where it says insert slide number inside of slide number you are gonna put date slide number footer and we're gonna put the copyright in there where do we put the copyright Option G, and then put your name in there. We just talked about copyright today. And then don't show on title slide. Check them all. Did you find this window? It's under insert slide number, right? Check all of those. And then look where it says apply to all. See that right there? Fly to all. Okay. When you're all done, Slide Master, you can close Slide Master right there. Again, go to Slide Master, close Slide Master, and ready to start making slides. Option G. Option. G and then type in your name I just check the box so again we have a title slide you can put in whatever title the title if you want whatever you want and you put your name in there whatever you want okay so there you go we got a title slide notice there's no footer on there because it's the title slide and we said don't put it the footer on the title slide okay next let's make a new slide to make a new slide with a chart here we go to make a new slide with a chart we're gonna go on to where it says new slide right there do you see the little arrow that's next to where it says new slide if you don't see new slide I'm under home new slide right here you'll see a little arrow that points down inside there i'm going to go to the one that says title and content title and content inside there i'm going to give it a title this is going to be flowers um in 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 bloom flowers in bloom and we'll do a chart with different flowers with different times of the year how about that Flowers in bloom. So, of course, right, you know, in in April, certain flowers are out. May and different flowers are out. June, different flowers are out, right? So we're going to make a chart, and then we'll animate the chart that says, you know, May, boom, 
June, boom, so on, okay? So here we go. We're going to make a chart with different flowers in bloom. To do that, you'll notice in the area down here, you'll see there's a middle one right there. It looks like a little bar chart. Do you see that one? It looks like a little bar chart there. It looks like a little bar chart right there. If you click on that one, it will then ask you what kind of chart you want. Let's do a column chart, and we're going to have it kind of, um, we'll do, uh, t uh, what do we want? Maybe two different flowers a year. Or let me think of the kind of chart we want to make. We want to do months, and you want to do, how about the amount of, yeah, but how many months? we got to give it a kind of a, well, I just wanted to see what, how to make the chart. So we got April, May, June, July, and then let's do uh, like two different types of, I'm going to do a stack chart, this one right here. I'm going to do a stacked 3D columns. I'm going to do a stacked 3D one. We have two categories, um, um, flowers that smell and flowers that don't smell, and then we'll have um, how many per month. How about that? I don't know. We're making this up, but I'm going to do a stacked one. 3D columns right here, boom, like this. When you choose that, it takes you into Excel. My gosh, look at it. It opened Excel. Very interesting that it just automatically opens Excel. In fact, I think it's even probably better to make your chart in Excel and then import it in or copy and paste it into um, thing because you're going to go in Excel anyways. So again, uh, what is our categories? So that would be months. This is going to be months. So we can even call this months up here. So we're going to say months, months, M-O-N. So I'm going to do months. And then this is going to be uh, April. And then this will be May. And this will be June. And then this one will be July. So that we'll have each month come up. July. And then what are we going to do? Flowers that smell, right? Flowers. Flowers um, that stink. How about that? Stink is T T I N K. Is that stinky flowers? Oh, we can make this bigger too so we don't have to. There. We got stinky flowers. And what do we have? Sweet flowers, flowers that are sweet. And then let's do one more. Uh, let's do uh, flowers that are, what are, What are kind of flowers do we have? Flowers that stink, flowers that are sweet, flowers that are what? Pretty. That's a good one, flowers. Pretty. Pretty. And then... Um, of course, in April, there's some good smelling ones, so we'll keep that high. Uh, May goes down a little bit. June maybe up a little bit. I'm just going to leave the default there. And let's leave the default there. Let's just leave the default numbers. I don't feel like changing them anyways. It's just, we just, the important thing is we're learning about the different um, ways to animate them. So again, remember, this is going to be stacked. So it's going to say April, it's going to have these are going to be different colors and then it'll say May with these different colors and June these different colors and July these different they'll all be like little colors that are in the bar right stacked okay so this is a stacked chart here So once you're done with your um, with your thing, how do you get back to PowerPoint? How do we get back to PowerPoint? I don't know. That's what was, I don't remember. It just automatically put it in PowerPoint last time. Just go back to PowerPoint. Oh, it's already there. Thank you. So it's already there. I, I would I want to save this, though. I'm afraid if I don't save it, oh, I can save it as a copy, I guess. I don't know. I guess we just go back to PowerPoint. If I can just close it there. I just closed it. I went back to PowerPoint. So let's change some of it. I mean, it looks beautiful and stuff like that, but um, 
you can see the different colors but what if you want to alter it a little bit as well you can do that you can change the colors if you want if this is too warm for you we can go to more of a um that that looks a little better easier to see uh, you can also give this chart uh, a title up here. So this is flowers bloom, blooming flowers that bloom. Um, this is kind of time of the year, right? Uh, this is all uh, months in bloom. bloom. And then um, what else could we do with this? Well, we can also change the background as well to change the background so that you can have a solid background in there. You can go to the paint bucket and say solid fill. That way it stands out from the background. You can also give that transparency. So something like that might look a little bit better. You might not be able to see it, but there, there you go. And maybe give it a little bit of a color. There you go. Something like that. That helps it stand out a little bit. Um, if you want, you can up the text a little bit by going under home and make the text a little bit bigger. Uh, maybe even a little bit bigger than that. There we go. You want people to be able to read it, right? So again, how do I change this? I have the whole chart selected. You have all these options over here from background color. See the paint bucket? That's the background color of your chart. And I also changed the size of the font of the text by going underneath uh, home, home right here. And you can change the size of the text right there. So try that. Try making the text a little bit bigger, and then we'll animate it. So try all those things that I just did. Make sure people are able to read the text in your chart. Again, how do I change that? I have my chart selected. Under chart format, you have options here. I gave it a solid background right here. I gave it a transparency so it's not so, not so, you know, I still see a little bit of the flower back there, but not too much, right? Solid little background right here. Then to change the font size, you go to home, home right here. And right here is font size. Make sure it's big enough for people, but not too big that it kind of interferes. 20 is probably going to get too big. Yeah, 20 is too big. 18 is pretty good. Yeah. Okay, let's animate. Did you guys all make a beautiful chart? You want me to come and see it? Are you cool? May, do you got a good chart? May, May, do I say your name properly? May, okay. Do you got a nice chart? Oh, the background is here. Format chart area. There, see the little paint bucket right there. The paint bucket. Paint bucket. Okay, that's all right. Let's just animate it. And we can we can figure out that in a little bit. Okay, let's animate our chart. So you're doing your presentation, and you want to have each month pop up during your presentation as an animation, right? Just like we've been doing. So how do we do an animation in a chart? Well, have it selected like I have it selected, right? See how it has little squares that go all the way around. It is selected. Chart is selected. I'm going to go to where it says animation right here. See where it says animation. And then you say, how do I want my bar ch bars to come in, right? I want them to either animate up or something like that. You have appear, which means they'll just pop on, right? Hence the word appear. Uh, blinds is kind of boring. Uh, what is this? Checkerboard now dissolve. Fly in is cool. Peek in, random bars, all these animations there. Swirl, you know, try not to make it too crazy or you'll be like the video. Remember the video of the guy saying all this stuff flying in? I kind of like fly in or appear is good. Appear just means it's going to pop on. So I'm going to do appear. So if you click on appear, it thinks you you want to have the chart appear, but we don't want the chart appear. We want each of the bars to appear, right? So once you have the animation here, once you click on it, you notice it says animation over here on the left side. In the left side, you'll see it says chart animations. There should be one that says chart animations because it knows you have a chart selected, right? If I twirl that triangle down, you'll see it says as one object. We don't want on one object. We want each one, each of the categories to come in. Categories, because each one is, so each category is a chart. 
So I have five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. Oh, maybe one is known. Yeah. So I chose category. And then you can test it by hitting the play button. Let's say, let's let's do a little play here. Where's the play button under slideshow? Play from current slide. Let's test it. So I have no chart. I have the chart. And I'm hitting the arrow keys on the keyboard. And I got one bar, two bars, three bars, four bars. Did you see that? Oh, to play it? To play it is under slideshow. Play from current slide. Play from current slide. And uh, I don't like a peer. That was kind of boring. How about fly in? Let's try that. Boom, 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 boom. That's a little bit funner. Try fly in. Let's try that one. Again, slideshow. Play from current slide. Let's try it. Boom, the chart comes in. And then you got boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 boom. So I want you to razzle-dazzle me in your presentation. I want you to come up here and make the best presentation. I want some animated bar chart. How about that? Can you do? You think you do that with a pie chart? Well, sure you can. You can have each pie come in. You want to try a pie chart? we got a couple more minutes. Who wants to try a pie chart? Okay, let's try one real quick. We can do it. Let's do one more slide. Here we go. I'm going to insert another slide. How do I make this again? Boom, under home. New slide. Boom. I'm going to go title and content right there. Do you see that? Boom. Title and content. Same thing. A new slide, title and content. And this will be pie chart. I don't know. Whatever you want to call it. So again, new, new slide, pie chart. And then... Again, right here, this is the little chart making thing right here. Insert chart right there. Boom, right there, boom. And this time, let's try pie chart and let's do a quick one here. So, again, just in the same area, again, it's this little symbol right there. We go to pie chart and let's go ooh, 3D pie chart right there. How about that? And then, so let's do flowers here. We're going to do uh, what kind of flowers? We have? Iris. Iris? Is that a flower? Iris? What's another flower? What's another flower? Rose? What's another flower? Lily? What's another flower? Which one? Tulip. Tulip. L I L T Lip. L I P. Tulip. And then um, these are flowers. Oop. Flowers. Flowers. And then these are how many um, number of flowers, number of, we call it. And let's do tulips. Let's make tulips a little bigger. There we go. So again, just like we did before, just make up some data. I just made up some data there. It don't matter what kind of data. The whole important thing is I want to show you that you can animate a pie chart. Okay, you can animate a pie chart. So once you animate, to get back to the animation, we can go to where the uh, PowerPoint is, and then you can see it right there. And again, if you want to change the colors, you can go over to where it says change color here. Now I know it has this warm kind of Christmassy color looking thing, but you can go and change the colors. Remember, you can change the size of the text as well if you want to change the size of the text. Bless you. Yep. And then you can change the text if you want. And then, again, just like, bless you again. So, again, just you can make a chart like you did. The most important thing is I want to show you you can animate. And wouldn't it be kind of cool if each of the pies come flying in? Wouldn't that be kind of cool? And you can actually have them fly from different directions, too. They don't all have to fly from the same direction. Wouldn't it be nice if they fly from the left or right or something like that? So watch how I do that. You don't have to do it. You just watch how I do it. You can try your on your own. I select the pies. I go to my animation. I go to fly in. I change again not to do a group, but I'm going to do by category. Again, the same way I did it, by category. But this way, 
you can go and choose like number two if I choose number two right here I can go to where it says um, emphasize effect or not emphasize where is oh here it is effects option right there and I can tell it which direction I want it to fly in so this one's probably number one two right here right here iris oh iris is number two probably I don't remember the order that I had them in what is the order what do I have first is yeah iris rose lily iris rose lily so um, number two is what did I just say iris which is this big one here so which way we want it to come in from this side, from the right. Boom, see that? And then uh, number three is the rose, uh, which is this one. We want it to fly in from the bottom. Yep, that's fine. From the bottom like that. Boom, right? And then number four is the red one right here. We want it to fly in from the left. Look at this. Boom, like a layer cake there, right? And then this one, number five, is the tulip, and we want it to fly in from the top. We want it to come down. We're going to go from the top. Boom. You see that? Okay, let's try it. Let's see what it looks like from current slide. Let's see it. Boom. So again, here we go. From the right, from the bottom, from the left, from the right, or from the top, I'm sorry. All right? So isn't that nicer looking? Nice presentation options, good little effects like that. How did I do that? You get your numbers in there. Remember, it's under category here. Get your numbers, and each number represents a different option. And then again, to change it, you can do effects right here and have it go from different directions. Wouldn't that fun? Doesn't that make for a nicer presentation? No? Yes? Again, how you did that was under animation, fly in, then change it over here to and fly in each category. I don't know. It won't give me that option anymore because I already have it there. But category is the option. So why don't you save whatever you did and turn it in if you want. I'm going to stop my recording.